What's up, everybody? It's Mover. Today we've got a great interview with Commander Rick Organ Hammonds, who has flown almost everything in the Navy, uh, flown Tomcats, which is awesome, part of the filming of the movie Top Gun, and I met him when I was in college, and he was probably one of the inspirations for me to become a fighter pilot. So uh, without further ado, Organ, welcome. Good to That's see you. That's a lot of pressure, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's awesome. Uh, I appreciate you being on the channel. It's good to finally see you and talk to you. We've been talking uh, through a text yeah. and phone. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing your story and just talking about the glory days of fighter aviation and all the different aircraft you've flown. Such a great career. Um, and I'll start this out like I start them all out. What got you in aviation? How'd you become a fighter pilot? Wow. I've been around airplanes all my life. My uh, dad started out when he moved to Homa with his mom years ago. Started out as a dolly boy, which puts the airplanes in the water, takes them out, cleans them and stuff. And eventually he progressed. And uh, the story I'd heard was that the guys would just come up to the ramp and stop and get to start it. And they pull them up and clean them. Well, he got more and more. Uh, I guess brave is the word, and he started doing more with the airplane, and eventually uh, took got airborne for a little while. And uh, the owner decided that he better give him lessons before he killed himself. So that's how he got started with aviation. And uh, oh gosh, long story awesome. short, he eventually had his own business with seaplanes. Uh, Home was big in the seaplanes back in the '60s, '70s, and, and early '80s, and uh, Dad had his own business. And eventually, the guy that he worked for worked for him later down the road. And uh, he also started a commuter airline that ran from Pensacola to Houston and along the Gulf Coast. So. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah that'd be yeah, awesome. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I think I was real fortunate in that uh, the foreign office, I don't know, you probably heard of Corky and Bill. Uh, Corky did mm -hmm. flying in uh, Octopussy and did a lot of other movies. Uh, uh, I can't even tell you, begin to tell you which other ones, but he had quite a few. <laughs> and, they were my inspiration, my heroes growing up. We didn't have a, a tower at that time in, in Homa, and uh, Bill and Corky would always be tearing up the airfield. Man, I just I, I love going out there and seeing the Bearcats and the uh, P-51, and Corky used to do, I, I think he was probably the, the youngest guy doing air show one. He was in his early 20s, and they eventually got another Bearcat and started doing Bearcat shows. And unfortunately, oh, wow. uh, Bill was killed in uh, an air show in Rhode Island in 1971, June 5th to be exact. And I always say this, you know, I know where I was and you probably remember where you were when Kennedy was shot, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well yeah. before your time. Might have been, you know, a, and, and, been a bit before me, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you remember where you were in 9-11, I remember where I was yeah. when, when my dad came out and told me that, that uh, Bill had been killed in an air show in an accident. And uh, they meant that much to me. He's the reason I went into the Navy uh, and, and like him and Clark here have always been my, my heroes and that inspired me uh, to do what I eventually did. I always wanted to fly, but in 1969, Bill got the, the Blue Angels to come down to Homa in F-4s on a 5,000-foot 5, strip, which is an event. Now that I've flown the F-4, that's an eventful 5,000-foot uh, strip. is not a lot of runway. So, And, and then in uh, 70, you got the T-Birds to come down. And from that moment on, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I mean, I always wanted to fly because my dad was my first hero. And then the foreign yeah. officer there, we had a lot of other pilots in the area that were always uh, inspirational to me, you know. And, and But that started it off. So that's how I got in the that's awesome. We talked about this kind of on the phone. It wasn't a straight line path, right? You had some people tell you, hey, us Louisiana boys, we don't do that kind of thing. I figured if, if I started writing to the Naval Academy when I was, you know, in ninth grade, which I did, that my packet would be this big and hopefully the other guys or gals would be this big. Of course, there's guys back then, but because uh, they're never yeah. going to see those people, they're never going to meet me. So I started writing letters, but I, I went into my guidance counselor one day and Mrs. F, I'll call her, and, and I said, uh, I'd like to get some information on the Naval Academy, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she said, oh, baby, we, you, we can't <laughs> compete with everybody else. People in the Northeast, she said, you know, you, you're not going to be able to go to the Naval Academy. And I had a 4.0 at the time, and I'm sitting there going, well, that's that's not right. <laughs> you know, I said, okay, that's great. Sir. We had another guy in his council, Mr. G, and I went there and said, Mr. G, I want to go to the Naval Academy. Oh, 
he started giving me books, you know, and gave me the Air Force Academy stuff too. And uh, so from there, uh, I started writing my letters. But uh, for your younger audience, some that might want to do this or do anything in life, you know, that was my first roadblock. And you just got to, sometimes you got to believe in yourself and just ignore the chaff and just keep moving on. And, and that's essentially what I did. And uh, awesome. it all worked out. So can't, that's can't, awesome. uh, so you went to the, you went to the Naval Academy. I did. Oh, tell me I about that. What, what, what was, what was that like? You know, uh, I, I just, we've got some buddies that I talk to every once in a while. And uh, there's a difference of opinion. Some say I wouldn't do it again. I'd do it again because for me, it was a vehicle to get to what I wanted to do. I wanted to fly jet fighters, and I thought that yeah. that was the best way to go. And for me, it worked out. And uh, so yeah, I'd do it again. You know, it, it was a great education. Got to do a, quite a few things, but uh, I'd certainly do it again. But if I had any advice, that I, and I like to give advice if anybody wants to, yeah. to do this, you know, for younger kids, uh, man, be a good citizen. Go out and, and – and, Get in the neighborhood and help. I did some elect pains when I was younger. Get involved with someone you care about because God knows we need some good politicians around nowadays. Something that someone that believes in the same things you do. Obviously, pay attention, stay out of trouble. I mean, everybody knows. At least you think everybody should know what's right and wrong. And, and I mean, babies know. Uh, right now, it seems a lot of excuses for people, but just do the right thing. And, and if you believe in yourself, work hard, and hopefully. Uh, you get to do what you want one day. And if it's flying fighters, good luck. Hope to see you there because it's a kick in the rear. There's nothing like it. Nothing like was it. it. Was it a culture shock, like a fish out of water, being a Louisiana boy, suddenly going to Annapolis and kind of seeing from that no, perspective? No, you know, and- it's funny. We were thrown together. We were thrown together. I mean, there were Admiral sons, Senator sons, and we uh, just, I mean, we had foreign dignitaries that had people there. Uh, and equal, man. They strip you down pretty good, and everybody's equal, and you start relying on one another. You're building a team. And yeah. uh, no, you know, the, there were uh, the, the only differences were that, and you probably may have been in the same boat. Louisiana calculus, for example, I took trigonometry as high as we could go. And uh, when I got to the Naval Academy, some of my friends, good friends now, had already taken calculus in high school. So Mrs. F was right about that. We were a little behind. But you catch up, you know, it, it doesn't take that long. I mean, uh, within certainly the first year at some point, you catch up and everybody kind of evens out, except there's a couple of guys that were so freaking smart that they validated the whole four years when they got there. You know, uh, I never caught up yeah. to those guys. So <laughs> never was, will. Was it challenging to get the pilot slot out of there? I mean, was it a tough like comp- competition or no, really? really much- actually, uh, we ended up, we started out with about 1500 people and we ended up with under a thousand, which is typical. We usually lose about a third. And the bottom guy in our class was able to go aviation. So wow. it wasn't difficult at that point, but it obviously started to get more difficult as we got into the pipeline, as you well know. Yeah. So, did, so where'd you go to pilot training? First thing I did was went to Pensacola, uh, flew T-28s and VT-2. We chose what path we were going to go, either jets, helicopters, or props, pretty quick. I did had 23 flights in the T-28 with 36 hours, and that's when we pipeline, picked jets, and uh, went down to Beeville, Texas to uh, fly the T-2 and the TA-4. I was 22 years old. And there are people out there that didn't have any flying experience. I, I did. I, I sold them on my 16th birthday, you know, the typical one from an aviation family. And uh, sold on a 152 and then uh, ended up soloing in a Luscom a week or two later because my dad said, you got to have tail dragger time to be a real pilot. So uh, ended up soloing in a Luscom. So I had that going for me. But everything you do, everything you do in the training command and even after it's a competition. You're graded, you know, and, and on everything. And so depending on where you fall out, th- it, that's the determination as to where you're going to go. You know, I had, uh, it's interesting because when we got through TA4s and you get your wings, uh, I had originally put F4s uh, as my first choice. And the reason being my history with Bill Fornoff and the, the Thunderbirds and the Blue yeah. Angels back in the 60s was F4s. And it's like, I want to fly the F4. 
And I got a call out of the blue from a lieutenant commander, and he said, Rick, I wasn't in Oregon at that time. He said, Rick, uh, I see you have F4s as your first choice. He said, you don't want to do that. I said, okay, why? And he said, the F4 is the history. That's the past. The F-14s were hard. They called me because I switched to the F-14s and ended up going to the F-14s on the West Coast in San Diego, which was crazy, man. Well, when I first got to, to Miramar, I went to VF-124, F-14s, and when we moved into the BOQ, and uh, BOQ, you can see the runway, and, and at that time, uh, Miramar had a high pattern and a low pattern. So there were F-14s coming in, in the break, high and low, and it was unbelievable, man. I knew I was in the right place. You know, I had a big smile on my face and uh, it was like, <laughs> finally I made the big leagues, you know, and, and that's what it, it felt like. And it was just incredible. And I, I'll never forget that feeling I had then. What, what was it like the first time you flew a Tomcat? I mean, that had to be an awesome experience by itself, getting in that jet for the first time. It was, it what was, was because the first like? time you flew it, you had an instructor pilot in the back seat but there are no controls in the backseat. So the first time you flew the F-14, you were it, you know? So obviously we were prepared. Military training is like no other. It's incredible. So you're prepared, you're ready. We've done a lot of simulators. I knew what I was doing, but it, it was a rush. It was a rush, you know, to fly it and to light the afterburners and to feel that. It, uh, it's a big airplane. When you look back, there's a lot of real estate back there. But if you don't look back, you can just, I mean, take the stick and roll it and boom, that airplane performed so well. Uh, a little later on, we can talk about the different airplanes I've, I've flown and I'll tell you what I, my thoughts on each one, but uh, I really, really enjoyed that. Man. It just, it was, it was a kick in the rear doing that stuff. So, but I don't want to give away everything in the F-14 because it, the, as a weapons platform, it really, and I know this is going to disappoint some people, it really wasn't a pure fighter. It was designed as an interceptor. It was designed to protect the battle group, the carrier in particular, from airstrikes. And uh, I know it's going to disappoint some folks, but uh, it didn't have the power that it needed. And it's important for people to realize that <laughs> this is a dangerous business. And I had uh, my first uh, death, if you will, uh, when I was in VF-124, a student in the F-14 RAG. And the the picture that if you show it of uh, me at 124, the guy that took that picture was a student real backseater. And I'm not going to mention his name. I'll call him Ensign Tim. And uh, about two weeks later, he was dead. And it was happened to be on a flight that I was on with him. I was a student pilot in one airplane with a, an instructor Rio. He was a student Rio with an instructor pilot. And we, it's so sad, man. These things always end up like this. We only had a week or two left and we got to fly against Top Gun and, and in a rag, I can tell you now, having been a Top Gun instructor, we just, we, we didn't fly against the rag that much. So I didn't appreciate it, I think then, but it, it I knew that it was, it was kind of neat to be going against, you know, Top Gun and it was two F5s and uh, unbeknownst to me, in the first two engagements, Tim was having some tunnel vision issues. We found out about this when, when we did the investigation, had to do our write-ups, et cetera, et cetera. But on the third engagement, I remember this like it was yesterday, I guess, because it hit me so hard. Uh, the two F5s had about a 30 mile set and they did a Polish heart attack, which for folks that don't know, they just split, separate to kind of force me and my wingman uh, to decide who you're going to pick. And if you they're going to outflank you if you pick one guy. So we had briefed beforehand that if they did that to us, we were going to go ahead and go 1v1. We're going to split up to 1v1s. The first two engagements went well. The third one, I was engaged to the west, and uh, Tim and Bullet were – Bullet was the, the pilot, and they were engaged to the east, closer to Mexico, out over the Pacific Ocean. And at the knock it off uh, – my F5 and the other F5 had to, to leave pretty quick because one of the things I realized later is that at Top Gun, we used to try to give them every penny of fuel that we had available. So they needed to get back to Miramar. And I asked, hey, where's Bullet? And uh, the other F5 other F5 pilot said, well, he was just here, you know, just engaging with him. And we looked around and couldn't find anybody, man. And so turned toward uh, Mexico and my real got a contact and I said, well, we got to go check it. He said, yeah, but he's out of the area. And I said, that's the only contact we have. Let's go take a look. 
So about a mile away from a barbison like that, I realized he didn't have a canopy, you know, and, and bullet was down like that. And the F-14 is just barbison. So we did a, a roll over the top. And to be honest with you, even that, I couldn't tell if the seat was in there because I thought Tim might have been leaning down. And, and you know how the, the, the seats go up rails where the rails are sticking out. And I couldn't tell if that was the seat or, you know, the rails. So I was trying to communicate with Bullet, and once we determined that he could fly the airplane, we called ahead to Miramar, called the Coast Guard out of North Island, and they came out. And we went down as long as we could, about 100 feet over the Pacific, and searched for Tim. And, man, I tell you what, when you get 100 feet over the Pacific, there's all kinds of stuff there. We found a sailboat that was turned over. We found a, a raft, but it wasn't a Navy raft. And just a lot of debris in the ocean. And eventually we had to, to go back as well and, and get back to Miramar fuel and when i landed uh i realized that we didn't he didn't make it he didn't have a shot and then when i talked to bullet i understand and i'm, I'm gonna show you briefly because let's see here i got all my models on. i had my f-14 model I had a beautiful f-14 model and i destroyed one of those but uh i'll use these tails the stabs on the f-14 had about eight, an 18 inch gas in the back on uh uh, on the forward side of each stab. So the seat came out and the parameters I learned later was that he ejected at, uh, it was about five and a half G's at 450 plus knots. And so the, the seat went up the rail and the railings, when I looked at the airplane were bent back. So the, the seat came back and tossed and turned in between and kind of beat up the, uh, beat up the vertical stabs. And I, I guess the good part of that is that you know, he didn't feel anything, so it, it was fairly quick. But uh, that was my first, not to be the last time that, uh, you know, we lost somebody uh, in the squadron or in the air wing. So uh, keep in mind, folks, that it's it can be a dangerous uh, business that we're in. So why did the why did he eject and not the front seater? Well, the, that was a good part was that uh, in, in two seat airplanes, if you're in the front and you eject, both guys go because the rocket motors from the seat are going to burn the guy in the back. So that's a dual eject no matter what. We didn't have a hand on the, in the back. But the students in the RAG in particular, and it depended on what the an instructor pilot wanted, but there's a handle in the back that you can select single eject or dual eject. As bad as it was, thank God that Tim was in single eject because otherwise they, we would have lost both of them. We would have lost the airplane. And wouldn't have known what happened. He didn't say why, why, like what caused him to want to eject in the first place. Like was what there, happened was on the first ejection? two engagements and, and bullet when we, you know, we all get in a room and, and write up yeah. this. And, and I mean, and, and of course we were young, early twenties. And so they were trying to keep us uh, from getting too emotional, I guess. But uh, we all discussed what happened and, and bullet had said in the first two engagements, Tim was getting tunnel vision and, the last thing he said in the third engage was pull up, pull up, pull up. And they were near the hard deck. So he suspects that, you know, with tunnel vision, Tim had looked in and instead of seeing 5,000 feet or 5,500 or whatever they were he at, confused. he thought they were lower. But after that, uh, the next stop uh, was VF2. VF2, one of the, it was a great squadron, man. We were loaded. The, uh, our XO eventual CO was the opposite of the rag. And, and uh, so he was uh, cherry picking people and we just had a, a really good squatter. I walked in the first day uh, in the training command, I was using bugs as a call sign. You know, we kind of pick our own before you get one, you earn one or someone assigns it to you. Well, when I walked into to VF2, Bug Roach was there and Bug was legendary. And uh, I'll talk more about Bug a little later, but uh, Obviously, I couldn't have the call sign Bugs with Bug Roach being there. So they already had Oregon pick for me, you know. And, and of course, the best thing you can do is just smile and say, thank you very much, you know, accept it. Because, uh, but I'm sitting there going, yeah. Oregon, what the hell's in Oregon, you know? And, and yeah. uh, it, you know, it's because of my last name, Hammond, Oregon, uh, is how uh, Bob Baker gave it to me. Flash Baker was the one who assigned me that. And I guess in a way it's kind of good because I have never, heard of another individual in the Air Force or the Navy that's call sign was Oregon. So if you see something that Oregon said, it's probably me. Because, you know, you have a lot of Hollywood, you have a lot of flexes, but yeah. 
I've never seen another Oregon. And I don't know if you, if you can attest to that, uh, yeah, you know, never. I, I, you were the first. I, I don't think people would want to have that call sign, but I've, I've had fun with it over the years. So first night landings. We're in 14. You know, we didn't do night landings in the training command. I CQ'd in the T2, CQ'd in the A4, and then CQ'd in the daytime in uh, the F-14, and then you go out at night, and oh, my God. <laughs> uh, night landings, there is nothing like night landing. Have you, have you Kerry Quad, have you been on done any night landings? No, I was the nothing. Air Force guy. They said I had to go back to 106, and they never could get, we never made yeah. that happen. There's nothing like it. I ended up with 96 night traps. I had the opportunity in the F-18 later on in my career to go and get another four to become a night centurion. And I said, I'm busy. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I can't do it. <laughs> so I ended up with 96. And I'm happy with 96. Yeah, man. no kidding. Um, wow. No, it's crazy. You know, in, in, you cut in the in the F-4, in, in any Navy aircraft, coming in, have a meatball, which is on the ship, line up and angle attack. So you're just standing here. Because in the Navy and in, in these aircraft, you don't fly from high. I don't drop the nose. You know, you're not flying like this up and down. You're flying with power and very small corrections. I move my hand this way because you want to move like that. You want to keep the same angle of attack. And if you drop the nose at all as you're coming aboard the ship, you're probably going to get a hook skip and a bolter. You're probably not going to trap on board. 14 is eventful in the daytime because you trap, you're at full power, you put the boards in in case you have to bolter. The guy runs out in front of you, he's throwing you back, you pull him back. Then you're raising the wings because the wings go to 68 and then you have to hold it and there's a, like a 10 second delay while the stabs come get out of the way and then you go into oversweep at 72 degrees. So you're sitting there and look, they're on a tight schedule, man. They don't ha have time for you to sit there. You know, they want you to move now. So I can remember doing this with the the, the wings, you know, because you got to put the flaps up too, of course, and that takes time and you flaps up and I'm waiting, holding the wing handle, I'm waiting for the override to come in, taxiing out as they tax me over here and I pull off to the side and that's what we normally dearm. Of course, we didn't have any armament on. I was sitting there and it's dark so you can maintain your night vision except you can still see things moving around the deck. And there were one of the tow tractors passed by and it gave me the sensation that we were moving. Oh, and I'm yeah. sitting there, I'm I mean, I got those brakes pushed through the floorboard, you know, and, and uh, I asked my back seat, I said, are we moving? And he said, no, 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 no. He said, that's just everything around us. You know, my hand on my leg, my freaking leg was shaking, man. Everything was shaking. I'm sitting there going up there, drilling, was rushing. And, and I just oh, sat there and enjoyed that moment because it's got to be down in, in the Super Bowl or something because, you know, I can imagine, you don't need thousands of people cheering for you. It was just the adrenaline rushing, and I was sitting there going, this is unbelievable. <laughs> you know, but it, it does. Night night traps age you. You know, it's not something you want to go out and do all the time. And uh, But that's my night trap story. And, and got to do more as we progressed uh, on into VF2. I made two cruises on the Ranger with VF2 and uh, ended up getting, I think ended up with about 307 traps overall. So wow. it was, it was wow. good. Well, it was good. What was your what was your cruise like? I mean, what kind of stuff did y'all do? Uh, being a West Coast air wing guy, we're on the Ranger, and you, you cruise out. You know, once you get on the other side of Hawaii, and, and you'll appreciate this, uh, there's usually an off-going carrier, and we get all their weapons, we get all their raw gear, all these stuff that we should have all the time, but the Navy doesn't have enough money to buy for us. So you know that. You flew the Hornet. So, uh, you know, the Air Force buys uh, – Air Force just buys airplanes and, and, and nice BOQs and stuff like that. But uh, we got the equipment coming on with the, the uh, uh, off-going carrier, and we unload and, and get their stuff. So from Hawaii on, we were always active. We always we were always armed, uh, and we pull into the Philippines, and you go from the Philippines and you know go out to the Indian Ocean. And for me, my first cruise, uh, they still had the hostages in Iran, and uh, yeah, we had uh, we. They, the failed hostage attempt was in April of 80, and we were working up. We weren't on station yet. We ended up cruising in September of 80 uh, for nine months. We, we were out there, but they still had the, the hostages, so we were on station in the Indian Ocean, ready to go. I remember we had still had contingencies in, in our flight suits. We carried, I think it was four different contingencies that if, you know, if this happens, you're going to go to this cap. If this happens, you're going to go to that cap. Uh, fortunately, 
Uh, it didn't escalate because when Reagan took office that day that he's inaugurated in 1981, January 20th, they released the hostages. So I guess they figured Reagan might have been a fool around. Like <laughs> Thank you.